Greetings fellow nerds, I'm Matt G, and today to start off our sort of writing guide tutorial series thing that we're going to be doing, I'm going to be talking to you about elves. Now I will specify, we're not talking about the, n the gnome-like elves that we see in Harry Potter and the Christmassy movies and stories, no. We're going to be talking about the warrior elves, the OP, arrow-shooting, legolas orientated elves. So first off, we should discuss what makes an elf an elf for the purposes of this talk. We can almost always agree that fantasy elves are usually slender, are often small and shorter than their fantasy human counterparts, and are usually considered beautiful in comparison to the more rugged and somewhat dirtier versions of the dwarfs and humans. Of course we do get some ripped elves, but I've yet to see Arnold Schwarzenegger play Legolas in one of the Lord of the Rings cast ripoffs. But while still being shorter, barring of course the elves in Warhammer and the high elf race in the Elder Scrolls, we usually almost always see elves being smaller in limb mass as well, which by appearance gives the impression of less strength. However, we see elves utilising the same level, if not more, than the average human. Another quality that we usually see is that elves have great eyesight, able to be better than anybody else in whichever fantasy race setting that they're put into. Another point that we should probably make about elves is their enormous lifespan. Now I'm not going to cover that too much as it does not necessarily play too much in the role of their abilities, aside from training. But in this point of training, if anybody was immortal, and trained for centuries instead of decades or individual years, they would be epically skilled in whatever it is that they're training at. And finally, the last point is their gracefulness. We often associate elves with light armour or agility form of physicality instead of the types that we see with dwarfs and orcs and their heavy armour and kick-ass massive weapons. But this often represents itself as elves being seemingly weightless and being able to perform manoeuvres of acrobatics bordering on supernatural talent, because often it usually is. So that's the elves for the purposes of this video. Shorter, yet equally strong. Great eyesight and other senses. With agility based senses with almost weightless precision. So now we know all of that, let's see how this applies to the elves in our own fantasy writing and world bu building. Let's start off with the weapons, and uh, by that point, ranged weapons. Now, typically the main choice for the elves is in ranged weapons is the bow. Oh, but I will specify, this is over things like crossbows and gunpowder projectile weapons, even to the point, in some cases, of throwing knives. Now, to, the, to me, this is a bit of a contradiction. So, like, on the one hand, but on the other, it makes perfect sense. As elves being smaller, lighter, and more agile would make them fantastic skirmishers. So they, perform, so they can perform things like uh, faint retreat tactics and guerrilla warfare, basically points where basically having to be very mobile over something like a, a Roman legionary they would excel at. So in a battlefield capacity, having ranged lighter troops at the back of the lines behind the safety of like the Kekos warriors like legionary shield walls, and would keep them safe from all heavier troops that they're fighting against. There is the point of better eyesight. Now, many people believe that archery is eyesight orientated, but the real truth of the matter is that eyesight doesn't necessarily play that much of a role in archery. Yeah, as is sort of put out in the stories and myths. Alright, let me explain this. You have two archers standing at the draw. The target is at the edge of the range and they both have the same bow. Okay. One guy is a human, the other is an elf. Now, the gift of extra eyesight here wouldn't be much of an asset because the elf can see the target so even if the elf can see the target better than the man, his ability to hit the target isn't extended by his ability to see it in greater detail. Because his ability to aim is more to do with the physical nature of holding the bow and having the strength to hold the string as steady as you aim, which I might add is something that is completely glossed over in movies and TV shows, with characters being able to just like pull back on the bow as if it's like 
They're literally just holding a feather in their hands. That is complete crap. So, of course, in situations where the human wouldn't be able to see the target as well, say in darkness, the elf would obviously be in better position, barring the limitations of the physical bow, because they would have the better eyesight to be able to see in these bad conditions. So having an elf with a longer range bow, such as a great war bow or a recurve bow which can fire further and faster, would obviously be great help. Now obviously a bigger bow is heavier in the draw, so the elf using it would need the strength of at least a human if not more, which is what we've already discussed. The but in cases where their stature would sort of downgrade their ability, the recurve bow would probably serve for the purposes of the elves much better than the war bow. Because one of the main things about bow, in a realistic point, is the longer your arms, the deeper your draw. The bigger bows require longer, deeper draws, and a war bow would be less affected, because these things are usually the same size of about a, the average human. Having smaller arms to pull these things back would mean that the, the string doesn't get tight enough to properly projectile this thing all across to where you need to go. Now, a recurve bow, specifically the types adopted by the Huns during the late Roman periods, would be more effective for their smaller um, users. They are smaller than the typical longbow, but are lighter due to their design. Despite the sort of the fact that the bow is smaller, it actually fires an arrow further and often faster. While a long bow tightens itself, a, tightens itself to fire the bow, the recurve bow literally pulls back on its limbs in sort of like the reverse of the way that they flow to give the arrow that extra snap as it uh, is fired and adds the extra oomph to the speed of it. That's a technical term, by the way. But of course, we're missing out the fantasy law point that fantasy elven craft is often superior to those of its other counterparts. But if we went down that road, we would just get stuck in a massive rabbit hole of contradictions and hearsay without any real facts. So I'm ignoring that point and just focusing on the realistic historical weapons that we have seen in history that usually appear in uh, the fantasy worlds. Now onto melee weapons. Now traditionally we see elves fall into the hunter-esque form of attire when utilising light weapons and using them using heavier weapons is usually quite odd. Obviously, this does happen, such as in Dragon Age, but I'm treating this as an exception. Traditionally, elves fight with, with one-handed weapons or daggers. Now, daggers are an interesting point because usually in the fantasy settings, if one is fighting with daggers in combat, they usually dual wield them. Now, combat with daggers is actually quite a futile thing to do in real life. Of course, in fantasy, daggers are quite romanticised, with a dagger-wielding person being able to cleave their way through people like they're made out of wet paper. Now, this is a nice idea. The realistic point about daggers is that while a blade is a blade and equally a good killing weapon in terms of I, will, I stab you, you'll die, the problem is their reach. Anyone with a longsword or a two-handed weapon will be a much greater advantage over the daggers because they can make strikes against their foe and, in theory, be in a safe zone where they can be protected by the distance from their opponent. Now where this isn't an issue, things obviously change, and given the elf's agility and heightened senses we can often assume that the elves are agile enough to bypass, through dodging or something equally acrobatic, blows from their opponents so that they can get into range to use their daggers in their full glory. Now this is a curious thing, because as I said before, if you stab someone in a heart with a dagger, or a spear, or a sword, or a hidden wrist blade, whatever, if it penetrates and hits an organ or artery, they will die. And that is something that a lot of video games sort of struggle with, because games do damage according to the weapon damage and the trace of the person wielding it. Few games still like, do damage according to the gloriousness, shall we say, of a good stabbing. Now, I'm ignoring headshot damage in this uh, talk because that's quite self-explanatory. If you hit somebody in the head, you do more damage. Now, obviously, there are some games that uh, can apply critical hit damage, 
but that is usually down to the traits of the person wielding the dagger. Say like in Skyrim for example, you will have to unlock the ability to create critical hits on your opponent with a melee weapon, which obviously wouldn't really work in real life. Sure, knowing where these uh, critical points are is one thing, but if you're but just swing your dagger around and you catch somebody in their neck or in their arteries, they are going to bleed to death. So obviously that works. But in the case of elves in real life capacity, elves would be utter annihilators with their daggers due to their ability to dodge heavy attacks and assuming that they've gone through the centuries of training, they'll be able to find those sweet spots in the armour, i.e. the neck, the joints, to get vital hits. Now, swords are a bit different, because, again, with reach. Where the elves are shorter, elves would need weapons that could help overcome their short reach. Now, I'll go into spears and pikes in a moment, because that's sort of like the obvious go-to answer, but in terms of swords, assuming that they find reach a problem, which obviously they don't with daggers, um, but then I would simply suggest something like a good old-fashioned longsword. It's a good, long, strong weapon with very few flaws, and the main thing about it is that you can alternate from one hand to two hand when you're using it. Now, one-handed has a maximum reach, because uh, but you hold it with one hand, you can hold it at arm's length, whereas with two hands you can sort of only hold it at something like something like elbow reach, where you have one arm at full reach and the other arm to meet it is only sort of like at your elbow. And it usually works best for defence, like covering your body with the blade. Often we see elves using katana like weapons in combat. Now this works, obviously, because these sorts of weapons work very well in a slashing and hacking forms of combat due to their curved edges. Now the traditionally, the katana isn't as long as the longsword, however. So if an elf was willing to abandon the reach problem again and just go for the dodging tactic, then they'd be alright. But if you wanted to get the maximum reach out of someone with short stature, the long sword would surely tick all the boxes. Now this isn't going into things like um, massive two-handed claymores or bastard swords or anything like that. This is just a traditional one-handed blade. Now I'll move on to spears and pole arms, because as I said, two-handed sword wielding elves is a bit of an oddity and in all honesty i'm quite happy to stick with that because the two-handed weapon requires a lot of weight and force to be around it and if uh, the elves are as you know graceful and light as they appear then chances are they're going to knock themselves over but moving on to sp spears and pole arms i see a lot of elves, particularly in things like Lord of the Rings or any other fantasy um, sort of like film that has particularly wood elves, um, I see a lot of them working with glaive-like weaponry, and to me this makes absolute sense. Now for those of you who don't know, a glaive is basically a blade on a long pole, sort of a cross between a sword on top of a spear. Now the spear is different because it's a long shaft with a small metal point on the end, whereas a glaive is a long pole with a long blade attached to it. Now, the best example um, that I could probably give you is the, the Naganasa in Japanese weapons. But spears are something that I've qu been quite looking forward to, because in my own writing, conspirators, my elves are all Greek, and more importantly, they're all hoplite fighters. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. Mainly because that's what the Greeks used, and they mostly relied on spears and pikes, using swords as secondary weapons in places. But the second and more relevant to this talk is they are of limited stature, and they are required to compensate for that with longer weapons. Now from my point of view, this makes sense, that elves, by virtue of grace and agility and nature, are very disciplined and, able, and very quick to react to battlefield orders without falling into chaos, like lesser species would be. And uh, to a point, this pretty much sums up Greek fighting to a nutshell. And this is basically what um, happens a lot, particularly where Greece went up against Persia, where the Persian soldiers weren't able to react in time to advanced situations, but individual Greek soldiers were. And the fantastic thing about spears and pikes, of course, 
are the formations that you can go into them with them, particularly the phalanx, where the troops line up in tight formations, present a shield wall with their spears out, pointing in rows, usually of three or more, and are able to hold against massive numbers, particularly in sort of tight spaces. Now, for me at least, this suits the elves perfectly as it removes the problem of reach. But effectively, any long reach polearm weapon could work, you know, from spears to halberds to glaives and long swords and even long spiked clubs, like the Gundug. So, in other words, long weapons used in deep discipline formation fighting, and this would work quite well, as I've said before, in regards to bows, as having a solid wall of shields and pikes holding back hordes and hordes of enemies would be the perfect environment to flank around, sometimes on horseback, and barrage the enemies with bazillions of arrows as all of their focus is in the swordsmen in front. I mean, even if the melee troops were flanking, the elves' mobility would be a massive asset. I mean, it would allow them to get across faster than normal, and even operate in dangerous and awkward territories. I mean, anybody who's played Assassin's Creed or Spider-Man game will know just how much of an asset being able to parkour everywhere is, uh, and if an army could do that, they would literally be unstoppable. Now, with all that in mind, I realise that I've missed something both obvious and of varying importance. And in the places where elves are shorter, like in this video, and they have less physical mass regardless of their strength, they will, will have one certain trait that is in their weight. It will be low. Now, epic skill aside, the basic rule of warfare is the heavier you are, the less likely you are to get beaten. And as I said, skill aside, but this is an important point in relation to elves. If elves act as if weightless a lot of the time in non-magical ways, so that it's just purely down to their physical characteristics, it would affect how they fight. So, if an elf went up against a Dwayne Johnson style enemy who could pick someone up and throw them aside like they're nothing anyway, and then apply the lower weight to the elf that while they're being picked up, they are going to end up with a bloody stain on the wall. And the same would apply to battlefield tactics. Now, while I say elves could hold the line in a discipline and morale capacity with spear and shield formations, if they were going up against stronger enemies, which, let's face it, the traditionally orcs and dwarves are generally considered stronger than elves, and they were able to knock them off, or even if humans uh, did a massive cavalry charge at them, it would be overwhelming to them. And by the argument of weight and physics, they would break very quickly, even maybe even on the first charge. Now, there is a simple way to go around this, aside from adding more weight to their armour and using magic, etc. And that is that the people on the front line wear spiked shoes. Now this is something I've never actually seen in fantasy setting, and if you guys have, I'd love to hear about it. But the idea is very simple. The elves march to their position with their spike shoes on. They literally dig in and brace, like in the traditional shield forward, swords up sort of fashion, with one leg in front and the other in back, and they literally slam these spikes into the ground. They literally dig in and they brace. Now, obviously this is full this isn't foolproof as it does have its drawbacks um the spikes would limit mobility and eventually they would wear out the ground beneath them in the same way plows and farming tools would so they would basically become less useful as the battle goes on and obviously they can't be used in mountainous and rocky terrain so that idea quickly gets hacked to death in those points but it does offer an interesting point because the weight to strength ratio doesn't exist with elves in the same way it does with mathematically with humans. So would the mathematics um, be completely destroyed in regards to them being able to be thrown around? Now, I would argue, barring obviously the Legolas and Bog fights that we see in the Hobbit movies, if a stronger opponent was able to lift up the elf and knock them on their arse, they would that that would basically be the how-to method of how to take an elf warrior down. But of course. Things don't usually work like that, because fiction. The elves are usually the good guys, for the, and the good guys usually have to win. But this is probably why we usually associate elves with operating in a more dodge and weave form of fighting. Because if they do have this major weakness, then they would have to play their, to their strengths to overcome it. 
But in terms of adding more weight to the elves, the warriors could also apply a simple tool to aid them, and that would be a shield. Now, I'm not talking about like a tiny little circle of wood, I'm talking about a big, heavy kite shield, something equally large. Now given that strength is no obstacle, they would be able to utilise these massive blocks of metal and wood to even greater degrees than their bigger human counterparts due to their smaller size. A human using a shield is typically exposed at their lower legs, arms and head, and they would have to compensate with armour. But an elf would be able to cover their entire body with these things. But of course this wouldn't really be much help to the adventurer elf or lone wolf, this lone wolf elf, because you know, these are sort of like battlefield weapons, an adventurer would have to lug these heavy things around and obviously if they're climbing up mountains or traversing through swamps that would be a problem. But obviously that doesn't really apply to video games where physics and in in inventories count for nothing. I mean, look just here, I've just put an entire suit of armour, helmet, sword and shield into a burial worm, about the size of my fist. So, general practice for the Lone Wolf is usually just the dodging and deflection routes. And the main reason for that is because you don't need anything in terms of a tool to do it, which obviously has its advantage. You just rely on your skill and, you know, obviously it doesn't work, then you, you don't have to worry about it because you're dead. So, there we have it. That's our analysis of elves in the fantasy genre, and most specifically the weapons that they use. For any writers who th out there who've decided to waste their time listening to me ramble, I hope you've learned something, or at least went, hmm, to some points. So, but basically in summary, uh, recurve bows for long range, long swords for melee, but an emphasis on spears and halberds if they are available. Um, for those of you who didn't watch this in terms of writing inspiration, one would ask why. But not me. Why? Because. And I'll leave you to think about how terrible that pun was, and I'll leave out the standard message about subscribing and liking and pressing the little bell thingy. Please comment on what you want to see next, and until then, peace out.